This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. Well, Miss Mary, I know that one very well, but it didn't help my singing any. By the way, uh, I think Brother Lynn Wood likes that song. He actually sent me a, a text message just a couple of days ago uh, that had a link to, uh, to someone singing that. They sang uh, much better than I sing. Not as good as Brother Jim sings, but much better than I sing. But I think Brother Lynn Wood likes that hymn as well. I will say this... Uh, just a humorous note. The sermon that we posted last Sunday morning, I already told you, YouTube took it down within, I think, less than an hour of it being up online. And I should have known that it was going to happen, but of course that doesn't affect what I preach anyway. But when, when I went back to look at it, YouTube, sometimes they will show you what part of the message got flagged and why they removed it. Well, the particular part that got flagged in that message was the part where I was talking about uh, those things that they like to stick in your arm. And I mentioned a particular person's name. And of course, the title of the message was The Cult of Death. And so I just thought it humorous that I preach all the time and call out the curly-headed preacher all the time and nothing ever gets pulled down when I talk about the curly-headed preacher. But when I talked about Bill Gates, it got yanked down. So that ought to show the curly-headed preacher just where he ranks in that overall hierarchy there. Uh, he's maybe not quite as important as he thinks he is. He certainly, apparently in their world, is not as important as Bill Gates is. Well, I want to bring you a message this morning that I am so excited about. I, I've been wanting to deliver it for two weeks now, but last week I felt like God had a different message uh, that He wanted me to deliver in conjunction with communion and observing the Lord's Supper. But this is a message that um, the Lord gave me, like I said, about two weeks ago. I just thought it was the message He wanted me to deliver last week until He changed it uh, or showed me at the last minute it was for this week, not last week. Our text this morning is found in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. And I'll give you a moment to turn there, but in 2 Thessalonians, just as with 1 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul covers, in addition to other subject matter, he covers the subject of the rapture of the church and the end times. The rapture of the church and the judgment which follows in this world uh, for the lost that are here, that is the tribulation period and the day of the Lord. But I want to bring a message to you that is narrowed down, focused on one particular aspect of the rapture itself. And again, it has to do with the timing of the rapture and not the timing of the rapture. And so if you're able to, would you please stand with me out of respect for God's Word? <coughs> I'll read our text this morning, which is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the first two verses. Paul, writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, says this, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto Him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now in this passage, Paul is specifically addressing a concern of those in the church of Thessalonica. And the concern that he is addressing is that someone had come into the church and was teaching that the rapture had either already come and gone or that it wasn't going to be until the end of the tribulation period. And that they, in fact, had found themselves already in the tribulation period. 
Apparently, Paul is addressing this concern because there were a number in the church there who thought they were in the beginning part of the tribulation and that they were going to have to go through the tribulation period. They apparently had been misled into believing that the rapture wouldn't be until the end, that they would be snatched out, taken out of this world. And so Paul deals with that specific thing in 2 Thessalonians, specifically chapter 2. I want to bring a message to you this morning that is intended to answer questions I have received from probably a dozen people in the last three months. And the title of my message is Putting the Final Nail in the Coffin of the Post-Trib Rapture. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would use this message for your glory and for our good. And Father, just as Paul addressed this same question in the minds and the hearts of those in the church at Thessalonica, dear God, I pray that you would once and for all settle this in the minds and hearts of our people. Lord, I pray that none of our folks would be fearful, worrying about going through the tribulation period if they know You as their Savior. Give them the peace, the comfort that You promised. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And you may be seated. The Apostle Paul, of course, is writing to the church at Thessalonica. And by the way, a little bit of history that I'll add to this here that I didn't know until just a few months ago when I was doing some studying for a different subject. The church at Thessalonica was located in the northern part of Greece, up in the area that is generally known as Macedonia. And the city was named Thessalonica. But there is a a part of Greece further south, kind of in the middle of the peninsula of Greece, that's known as Thessaly. So you would think that Thessalonica would be in Thessaly because the two names come from the same origin. But come to find out, the the city of Thessalonica was named by the Macedonians who conquered the Thessalonians. And so they named a city after the Thessalonians. And the the name Thessalonica means we conquered Thessaly. Uh, So I just thought that was interesting. They, They kind of created their own trophy by naming an entire city, we conquered you. Uh, But the city is up in their land, not down in Thessaly. But Paul is writing this letter as a follow-up letter to what we know as 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, in chapter 4, Paul describes in great detail the rapture of the church. His appearing in the clouds and catching us up together with Him. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, we're going to look at a number of passages of Scripture this morning. You can either turn to them or you can just listen, whichever you'd rather do. But the primary portion of my message this morning is on the timing of the rapture. And I discussed this in several messages over the last year, but this particular message, I hope, will be that final nail in the coffin for the belief in a post-trib rapture of the church. Not necessarily here at Pinnacle Baptist, but in other other areas of, of life, there are those who teach and preach that the rapture of the church is not going to be before the tribulation, but that the Scriptures in fact teach it will be at the end of the tribulation. Meaning that the church is going to go through the tribulation right along with the rest of the world, and we won't be taken out of here, raptured up to meet Him in the clouds, until the end of the tribulation itself. Now, I'll talk more about that in just a moment, but I just want to tell you that it is not God's desire that you or I sit and spend a moment wondering or worrying whether we're going to go through the tribulation period. That is the specific reason that Paul penned this letter to the church there at Thessalonica, because they had the same concern. They thought that somehow Paul had been wrong in his interpretation of the coming day of the Lord, that judgment that is coming, 
and that the rapture had not, in fact, occurred before the tribulation period. Now, if you read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it talks about the rapture. And then in chapter 5, it goes on to talk about the day of the Lord and the judgment that is coming after the rapture of the church. But these people apparently had someone who had come in and had told them, listen, Paul must have been wrong. The verse that we read there in verses 1 and 2, the passage, it seems to indicate that someone may have even forged a letter from the Apostle Paul trying to make them believe that Paul had written saying, I was wrong and that the tribulation is already upon us and we'll be raptured at the end of this. Apparently someone was trying to mislead the church there at Thessalonica. By the way, there are people, including preachers, in churches all across America that are also trying to mislead Christians about this. I really do not know what the motivation is, whether they believe they are sincere students of the Word and trying to exegete the passages that deal with the end times correctly, or whether they just think that there's some reason that God wants the church to go through the tribulation period. The Bible clearly does not teach that, and we're going to see that this morning. And I'm going to attempt to do what I generally do when I'm laying out a case trying to uh, convince you of something. I'm going to present a series of evidences or arguments. The ones that I'm going to start with are the ones that I think are good evidences from Scripture, but they're not the hardest-hitting evidences. The strongest, hardest-hitting evidences will be near the end of the message. So you'll have to stay with me to get to that part. But the case is clear in Scripture. God in no way intends for the church to go through the tribulation period. Now, I'm using the, the front of the platform up here, and I want to describe what the three main views of the tribulation period are just in case there's anyone that's uh, maybe new that will be listening at some later time. Those of us who believe that the rapture of the church is next on God's prophetic calendar, that it will occur before the tribulation begins, we are what is generally called pre-trib, pre-tribulational in our view of when the rapture takes place. There are some who believe that the rapture of the church won't take place before the seven years of tribulation begins, but in the middle of the tribulation period, around the three and a half year mark. That's called the mid-trib view of the rapture. And then there are those that we're discussing this morning who believe and teach that the rapture in fact won't occur until the very end of the tribulation period, So while we're called pre-trib, they're called post-trib, meaning at the end of the tribulation, after the tribulation. And they basically believe that the second coming of Christ, which occurs at the end of the tribulation period, described in both the book of Revelation and the book of Zechariah and numerous other passages, when the Lord descends and sets foot on the Mount of Olives and it cleaves in two and He destroys all the enemies that are arrayed against Israel at the battle of Armageddon, that, that, that day and time, the second coming, the second advent of Christ is also when the rapture will occur. Well, preacher, how can we be raptured up if He's coming down? Well, they believe that uh, while He's coming down, we will rise to meet Him in the clouds, kind of as a welcoming party, and then we'll come right on back down with Him. So we're not really going anywhere with Him. We're coming right straight back down with Him. And that's the post-trib view of the rapture. The pre-trib, the mid-trib, and the post-trib. It used to be that there were also some who believed that the rapture would actually be after the millennial reign of Christ, which is another thousand years after the tribulation, and that was called post-millennialism. 
The reality is the the people who used to primarily teach and preach that were those usually who believed in covenant theology, most Presbyterians, some Reformed Baptists and others, but they believed that the world, Christians and the church were basically going to get the world good enough to usher in the return of Christ for us. There aren't too many who believe and preach and teach a post millennial rapture of the church anymore. So I'm not really even dealing with that this morning. We're dealing with a post-trib rapture of the church. The belief that the church is going to go through the tribulation and then will be raptured out. But that's not what the Bible teaches. And I want to present that to you this morning. The rapture, of course, is what Paul calls our blessed hope as the church. It's our blessed hope because it means that He is coming back in the clouds to receive us up, to take us with Him so that we won't be here during that awful period known as the tribulation period. In Titus chapter 2 verse 13, I've preached a message from this very passage before. Paul said, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's our blessed hope. The rapture is of great interest or should be to all Christians because we're looking forward to seeing the Savior. The great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul doesn't make any bones about who Jesus is. He's the great God and our Savior. We believe in a pre-trib rapture because the Scriptures, I think very clearly, in every place, in every way, indicate that it's before the tribulation. There are those, as I said, who believe it's somewhere around the middle, and we're not dealing with that discussion this morning, maybe at another time. But we're refuting the notion that God is going to wait till the end of the tribulation. The post-trib rapture of the church is called by different names, by different theologians. Sometimes it's referred to as the the historic view of the tribulation, uh, of the rapture. And those who refer to it as the historic view of the rapture are calling it the historic view because that's a loaded term. The The implication of calling it the historic view is that the pre-trib view that you and I believe is not the historic view of the church regarding the rapture. Well, it is a historic view because there have been those who believed in the post-trib rapture, but just because there have been those throughout history that might have believed this, that doesn't mean it's the biblical view. In fact... It's obvious that those in the church at Thessalonica, some of them had come to believe it was a post-trib rapture that was to come. But that doesn't mean that it's biblical. In fact, yes, it's historical because there were some people who believed it at some place in history, but Paul clearly tells them this is not the case. And then he goes on in 2 Thessalonians in greater detail to explain that. Now, In the past, I preached a message where we went through 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 to demonstrate that. This morning, I want to present uh, a number of different pieces of evidence that are not all from 2 Thessalonians. That's only one of the passages we'll look at. So allow me, if I may, to give you the scriptural proofs that the rapture is not post-trib. Number one. The belief in the imminence of the return of Christ in the clouds for us. That is that the Apostle Paul taught and preached and that the Apostle John taught and preached in the book of Revelation that the catching up of the church into the clouds was imminent in their day. That is that it could happen literally at any moment. It is obvious that the Apostle Paul preached the imminence of the rapture. 
We know that because the reason he's having to deal with a, uh, a problem in their thinking there with the Thessalonians is that they somehow had come to the conclusion he had been wrong and that they were going to have to go through the tribulation period. And that's why he talks about them being so shaken because they've been removed from what he taught them and now they're thinking they're going to have to go through the tribulation. So now he's writing this second epistle to correct the, the error, the misunderstanding on their part. But clearly, he would not have had to write to correct this and they would not have been thinking they had somehow missed something and that it was going to be at the end had he not clearly taught them that it was going to be at the beginning. The reason that he's writing this is because they've been removed from what he had taught them, which makes it clear to us that he had preached on the imminent return of Christ in the clouds for the church, a pre-trib rapture of the church. And the reason they were removed from that is because they had fallen off into listening to someone else or reading something that was a forged letter supposedly from Paul or one of the other apostles, and they thought that they had gotten it wrong. That's an indication to us that Paul taught and preached the imminent rapture of the church, that it could happen at any moment. Folks, if it's a post-trib rapture of the church, that's not imminent. You and I are going to see all those events that are laid out and described and explained in the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. We're going to see all those played out before the rapture if it's a post-trib rapture. It can't be imminent and be post-trib. So the Scriptures are clear. The Apostle Paul certainly believed it was a pre-trib rapture. John believed it was a pre-trib rapture. Peter believed it was a pre-trib rapture. Again, I'm starting with the, the light part of the evidence and we'll get to the harder hitting things as we go along. But the very argument that Paul is having to address this because they've been removed from what they were taught and now they're believing in a post-trib rapture means he had previously taught a pre-trib rapture and they had been led astray. Number one, the imminency of the rapture. Number two, comfort. The comfort of the rapture. The comfort of the teaching of the rapture. Paul said, and you know this in the passage in 1 Thessalonians where he addresses the rapture and explains it to this same church. He ends the passage with verse 18 which says, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. And then he goes on in chapter 5 of that epistle to explain the coming tribulation and day of the Lord. So Paul says, be comforted. You're going to be raptured out of here. You're not going to go through what I'm about to tell you about. Be comforted. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. He said the same thing again in 2 Thessalonians, the book that we read our text this morning, chapter 2, verse 17. He said, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Again, there's really no comfort in the view of the rapture that says you're going to have to go through seven years of tribulation and then you'll be raptured out of here. Where is the comfort there? I don't know about you, but thinking about not myself necessarily, but my loved ones who know Christ. Having to go through the the awful seven years we see described in this book as God's wrath is poured out upon the earth, even if it's just being poured out on those around us, there's still little comfort at the thought of having to be here in the midst of all that as it's going on for seven years and then being raptured out. The comfort is that we are going as the church to be removed before all of that begins. We will be removed before the day of the Lord begins. Number one is the imminent rapture of the church. Number two is the comfort that is taught about the rapture. Number three, 
the illogic of a post-trib rapture occurring at the same time as the second coming. As I already explained to you, those who believe in a post-trib rapture believe that the church will be raptured out at the end of the tribulation. We'll meet the Lord in the clouds, do a U-turn and come right straight back down with Him. Because we know He's coming back. And the passage clearly says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And the book of Jude says that Enoch prophesied concerning the the Lord returning with ten thousands of His saints. It's clear that we're coming back with Him at the second coming. So if there's a post-trib rapture, we're going up, meeting Him in the clouds, doing a U-turn and coming right back down. There's something that's not quite logical about that. You say, well, preacher, that's not really a scriptural thing. I know, so I'm moving on. But I submit to you that is yet an evidence, I think, for our God is a very logical God in everything He does. Number four, in God's address to each of the seven churches of Asia at the beginning of the book of Revelation... In Revelation chapter 3, God gives a specific message to the church of Philadelphia. Listen to what God says in Revelation 3 verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. There's very little debate among Bible scholars and theologians as to what the time period is we're talking about, uh, that hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. It's, it's It's the tribulation period. And the Lord said to the church there at Philadelphia, because you've kept my word, kept the word of my patience, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation. God did not say to the church, I will keep you from the consequences of the temptation or I will keep you from the, uh, the, the awfulness of the temptation. No, He said, I'll keep you from the hour of temptation. Hour meaning a span of time. God told the New Testament church, those that were truly born again, truly believers, that I'm going to remove you out of here. You won't even be here. I'll remove you from the hour of temptation. Okay, preacher, I'm still not convinced. All right, well, I still haven't gotten to the good stuff yet. But I think all of these are biblical evidences. Number five, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a phrase that is used in both the Old Testament and the New Testament to describe the coming judgment of God upon this earth. It's used, I believe, 19 times in the Old Testament in various books of the Bible. And then it's used several times in the New Testament as well. But the phrase, the day of the Lord, always has the same meaning, whether it's in the Old Testament or the New is talking about that final judgment of God in the end times. And when we see that phrase, the day of the Lord, it always has two components to it. And that is the judgment of the wicked and God's blessings upon His chosen people. The judgment of the wicked and His blessings on His people those that truly belong to Him. Not say they belong to Him, but truly belong to Him. They've believed on Him. The day of the Lord is important because when we look at Scripture, that phrase, the day of the Lord, is always, always, always connected with Israel. It is not connected to the church. I preached a message several months ago entitled, The Church is Not Israel and Israel is Not the Church. And one of the things that people get so wrong about the end times and prophecy is conflating the two, confusing them, and mixing up the church and Israel. 
And if you mix up the church in Israel and think they're one and the same or a continuation of the same, you're going to mess up on your interpretation of end time events. Because the church is one entity, Israel is a different entity. God has given them both a different set of promises and they both have different destinations during the tribulation period. But that phrase, the day of the Lord, in addition to people being confused because they confused the church and Israel, and Israel being one and the same, it also becomes confusing, especially when someone reads Matthew 24 and 25 and Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount about the end times because Jesus covers a lot of things in chapters 24 and 25 of Matthew that has to do with prophecy. And people assume that the day of the Lord is only talking about that day at the end of the tribulation when Jesus returns visibly, physically, and sets foot on the Mount of Olives, destroys the enemies of Israel at the Battle of Armageddon, they assume that because it is the day of the Lord, that it is only a one-time event, occurrence, just like any other 24-hour day. But the reality is that the day of the Lord is that entire seven-year period which culminates at the time of the second coming. Well, preacher, can you prove that? I'm not going to read all the passages of Scripture this morning, so you can do your homework, look up the day of the Lord in a concordance or online, and find all the times the day of the Lord is mentioned, and you'll see that the day of the Lord is not just referring to that day of the second coming, the second advent, when the battle of Armageddon takes place, it also encompasses other parts of the end times, including the tribulation and the things that happen during the tribulation. It includes things that even happen going into the millennial reign of Christ. Because again, the day of the Lord is the judgment of the wicked and the blessings of God upon those that are His. It's two facets to the day of the Lord. It's the same with the day of the Lord when you read the Old Testament and God said in the book of Amos that um, He was about to send a swarm of locusts into the land of Israel. There was going to be a coming judgment then and a future coming judgment of the day of the Lord. He judges the wicked and He blesses the righteous. But it's always related to Israel. Well, the day of the Lord has nothing to do with the church because the church is going to be out of here. It's because when the church is raptured out of here at the beginning of the tribulation, God has once again turned His attention back to Israel and dealing with the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so the day of the Lord is once again in play because He's not dealing with the church but with Israel. And by the way, if you need a further proof that that term, the day of the Lord, is not just referring to that one day at the end of the seven years when He comes down to the Mount of Olives, when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, Peter quoted the prophet Joel from the Old Testament about the day of the Lord and he says, Peter said, this is what the prophet Joel spoke of. And he was talking about the day of Pentecost. That was at the beginning of the church age, the age of grace in which we live, 2,000 years ago. How could that be the day of the Lord and the second coming also be the day of the Lord? 
It's because it is a truth that the phrase the day of the Lord does not just mean one day, but a period of time. In fact, the entire end times period. Well, preacher, does that mean that the age of grace in which we live now, the church age is part of the day of the Lord too? Nope. This was a down payment, an initial installment on the day of the Lord that was given on the day of Pentecost. And if you'll go back and read the book of Acts, it was Jews to whom that miracle was given. There weren't Gentile believers at that point. They were all in Jerusalem. They were Jews from all over the Roman Empire that were gathered there that heard the preaching of John and Peter that day. And over 3,000 souls were saved. But Brother Jim, they were all Jews. And so the day of the Lord began on the day of Pentecost. That was God's reminder to Israel that the day of the Lord is coming. Here's the first installment of it. Here's the promise. It's really coming. But then there's this parenthetical expression of 2,000 some odd years in which we've lived since then when God has been dealing with the Gentiles primarily as His tools to evangelize the world, at least those Gentiles who are part of the church, along with Jews who are part of the church. But when the church is taken out of here, That's why we once again begin to see a discussion of the day of the Lord. Because the church has gone out of here. And the tribulation period is meant for God's judgment on the Gentile nations for their wickedness. But it's also intended to purify Israel and get rid of all the rebellious, unbelieving Jews as well. To purify Israel. So that phrase, the day of the Lord, it's not just that single day at the end of the tribulation, at the time of the second advent. It's the entire end times period that is referred to as the day of the Lord. And if you'll go back and read Matthew 24 and Matthew 25 with that understanding, there are a lot of things that make sense about the day of the Lord that would not make sense if you thought that it all had to do with that one day at the end of the tribulation period. I say that because in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, Jesus talks about the rapture and He also talks about the second coming. And those who believe that the day of the Lord is only one 24-hour day, if you believe that, if you assume that, then you have to assume that the rapture and the second coming are the same day. But I've just demonstrated to you that the day of the Lord is not just a single 24-hour period. Many of the things described in the middle of the tribulation are also called the day of the Lord. And that day of Pentecost, 2,000 years ago, Peter, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, said this is the day of the Lord, which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So the day of the Lord, do not be cornered, boxed into believing that because Jesus talked about the rapture and the second coming, both in Matthew 24 and 25 regarding the day of the Lord, do not be boxed into believing that they both have to happen in that 24-hour day. That is not so, and it does not follow scripturally when we compare Scripture with Scripture. Number six. By the way, I only have seven. So here we are at number six. Number six, God would not pour out His wrath on His bride. I addressed this in a Wednesday night question and answer session several months ago in a short form. But if we believe in a post-trib rapture of the church... We have to believe that God is pouring out His wrath on the earth while the bride is still here. His bride, the church. In Revelation 21 and Revelation 22, we, the church, are referred to as the bride of Christ. 
there's going to be a big marriage uh, supper of the Lamb in heaven where we're the bride. He's the bridegroom. Well, if you believe in a post-trib rapture of the church, that means that during these 2,000 years, people have been getting saved, becoming part of the church of the living God, becoming part of the bride of Christ. That's you and I. And if we're not going to be raptured until the end of the tribulation, that means Jesus is going to say to the church something along these lines. I love you. You're my bride, my precious bride. I'm preparing a marriage feast for us. And then He proceeds to, to beat up His own bride. Abuse His own bride. Some say, well, preacher, the church has been being persecuted for 2,000 years. What's any different between, difference between that and the tribulation period? Well, the last 2,000 years, yes, the church has been being persecuted... But God wasn't the one pouring out wrath upon the church. The world has been pouring out wrath upon the church. But during that seven years of the tribulation period, God is pouring out His wrath upon the church. And for those who say, well, He's he's mainly just doing that the last three and a half years. Yes, I know it is mainly ramping up in the latter three and a half years. But when you go back and you read what will take place in the first three and a half years... That's no picnic either. A third of the earth's population is wiped off the circle of the earth in the first three and a half years. That means that the bride is going to be put through the same things as the lost by the bridegroom. What bridegroom who loves his bride would marry her and on their wedding night would allow her to be beat up and abused before welcoming her. No bridegroom would do that that loves his bride. Should we think that Jesus is any different than we in that regard? God would not pour out His wrath upon His own bride. And yes, I know that the church has been persecuted for 2,000 years, but God wasn't the one doing it. God is going to be the one doing a whole lot of what goes on in the seven years of tribulation. He has told us, comfort one another with these words. Why? Because we're not going to be here during this time. He's promised to the church He's going to remove us from the very hour of temptation. Hour is a period of time. We're not going to be here. We're His bride. And then finally, my number seven evidence, and the one that to me is perhaps the strongest piece of evidence, the rapture and the second coming cannot be at the same time. Because the time of the rapture is unknown. Listen to what the Bible says in Matthew 24, beginning in verse 36. You know the passage, but here's what it says. Jesus speaking said, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as, in the, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And he knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, 
he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Elsewhere the Bible tells us that of that day and hour knoweth no man, not even the angels in heaven, and not even the Son of God. He has voluntarily restricted himself to not knowing when the Father is going to send him and say, go and get your bride. The timing of the rapture is unknown. The Bible clearly teaches it in multiple places. If it was known, then we could all be prepared for it. We do just like the Jehovah's Witnesses have done on occasion, just like the Millerites have done on occasion in the past. We would all have our bags packed and uh, everything put right in our lives and we'd be up on top of a hill somewhere waiting for Him to come so we could be the first ones up. But we don't know when it's going to take place. And so for that reason... We must always be prepared for Him to show up. Paul was ready and watching 2,000 years ago for Him to show up. And I think Paul thought He was coming in his day. I think Peter and John from their writings in the New Testament, I think they thought He was coming in their lifetime. But He didn't. And here we are 2,000 years later, a lot of Christians buried out back here and other churches all over the land... And He hadn't come in their lifetime either. We don't know the timing of the rapture of the church. But, but, are you listening? But we do know the exact time of the second coming of Christ. Preacher, how do you know the exact time of the second coming if you don't know the time of the rapture? Well, let me show you. Now, I'm going to read a lot of Scriptures here in just the last couple of minutes. Please don't try to turn to them all because I'm going to move quickly. But I want you to listen to them because they all describe exactly when the second coming of the Lord will take place. Daniel 7.25 And he, that is the Antichrist, the little horn of Daniel, shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into His hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. A time, times, and the dividing of time. One plus two is three, and the dividing of time is a half. Three and a half. We're talking about the the latter three and a half years of the tribulation period because remember it's in the middle of the tribulation when the Antichrist breaks his covenant with Israel and not only breaks his covenant with Israel but sets himself up to be worshipped in the temple of God in Jerusalem. That's at the middle of the seven years. Three and a half years on that side three and a half years on that side of the event. The abomination of desolation, Daniel calls it. Jesus said, the abomination that maketh desolate. When the Antichrist reveals himself as who he is, he's fooled Israel the first three and a half years. Now they see him for who he is. Not the Christ, but the Antichrist. As the passage we just read says, He will wear out the saints. Those that are truly born again will be decimated by the persecutions of the Antichrist during that last three and a half years. Listen to Daniel 12 verse 7. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swear by him that liveth forever that it shall be for a time, times, and in half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So when the Antichrist is revealed, 
He's got a time, times, and half a time until it's all fulfilled. All finished. Revelation 11, verse 2. But the court, which is without the temple, that is outside the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. The holy city of Jerusalem is going to be tread underfoot forty-two months. How long is forty-two months? Oh, it's the same as three and a half years. Revelation 12, verse 6. And the woman, that is Israel, fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. One thousand two hundred and sixty days. Now, I need to remind you, in case you're not familiar with it, Jewish calendars are lunar calendars. They're 30-day months. Every month has 30 days in it. No Februaries. Every month has 30 days in it. Two thousand, excuse me, a thousand two hundred and three score days is three and a half years. Forty-two months. Revelation 12 verse 14. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. Then she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Revelation 13, 5. And there was given unto him a mouth, that is the Antichrist, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. There's that latter three and a half years. In Daniel chapter 12, verses 11 through 13. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, that is, this time, this event, in the middle of the seven years, the abomination of desolation, when the Antichrist sets himself up to be worshipped in the temple of God, listen to what it says, from that time there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. That's thirty days more than the twelve hundred and sixty that make up the three and a half years. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. So here's a thousand three hundred thirty five days, which is even further than that. But go thou thy way to the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Every passage that we have just looked at in both the Old Testament and the New, except the one I just finished, said that there are 42 months, 1260 days, three and a half years from when the Antichrist is revealed until it is finished and Christ returns. 1260 days. Now, we do not know when the rapture of the church is going to take place. It's unknown. We know exactly when this event is going to take place. And every believer who is saved during the tribulation period, they're going to know how much longer they have until this gets here too. They will know when this day is coming. Because the Scripture says 1260 days. From the day the Antichrist presents himself there, 1260 days. They have to make it. Hold out for the second coming of Christ. We know the time, the exact time of the second coming of Christ. And every person that gets saved in the tribulation period will know when this day is coming. It won't come as a thief in the night. This is known. The rapture is unknown. You can't have them both be the same moment in time and it not be known by the saints and be known by the saints. It can't both be true. You say, well, preacher, in the passage you just read, there's another 30 days and then another 45 days. What are those 
30 and 45 day periods after the second coming, what's being talked about there in the book of Daniel? Jesus said after the tribulation is over, but before the millennial reign begins, there's going to be a judgment called the judgment of the sheep and goats. You can go back and read that in Matthew 25. I don't have time to do it this morning. The judgment of the sheep and goats is where at the second coming of Christ, He destroys all the armies that are arrayed against Israel at the battle of Armageddon. But there are still people all over the world that are not there at the battle site. Some of them believe on Him. Most of them do not. The Bible says... He is going to have a judgment of the sheep and the goats. Every individual of all the nations will come before Him while He's there in person in Jerusalem as the judge. They're going to be brought to Him one at a time. Those that are unbelievers, the wicked, He's going to have them cast into hell, prepared for the devil and his angels. Right there, before the millennium even begins. Those that have believed on Him, that are righteous, they will go into the millennium. Those that are being judged at the judgment of the sheep and goats, that's what's being done in that extra time after the 1260 days over the next... 75 days before the millennial reign begins. These are real people in real time and there has to be time for them to all be brought before Him one at a time. I'm going to be honest with you. Even doing it in 75 days sounds fast to me. But there will be no no lost people who will go into the millennial reign of Christ. I didn't say there won't be lost people in the millennium because there's still going to be people being born for a thousand years. You can have a lot of babies in a thousand years. But all those going into the millennial reign of Christ will be people that are saved. So, if the rapture takes place at the end of the tribulation, the same time as the second coming. Those that are raptured, even if they're just taken up into the clouds to meet Him in the air and come right back down, there, there are no sheep to be judged. They've already, been, they've already been identified. There is no sheep judgment of the sheep and goats. If the rapture takes place at the end of the tribulation... They've already, the sheep have already been identified. You'd have just a judgment of goats. The fact that there's a judgment of sheep and goats of those that are on the earth at the end of the tribulation before we go into the millennium means that there are people that are, will have gotten saved during the tribulation period that have not yet been identified as the sheep. And that's why we'll have the judgment of the sheep and goats. That kind of piggybacks onto that final point that I made, though it is really a separate proof in itself that there can't be a post-trib rapture. But that point that we don't know the timing of the rapture, but we absolutely know the timing of the second coming, means they cannot be at one and the same moment in time. I I hope, my desire is that you are convinced from Scripture now that the rapture of the church is a pre-trib rapture of the church. It is absolutely, positively, no possibility, a post-trib rapture of the church. And I'm going to be honest with you. I've encountered a lot of Christians, including preachers, who almost act self-righteous toward anyone that believes in a pre-trib rapture because they almost act like, well, you don't think God can protect you during the tribulation period. Where's your faith? 
What kind of Christian are you? It's not a matter of whether God can or would or wants to. It's a matter of, uh, excuse me, not a matter of whether He can, but a matter that He doesn't wish me to go through this. He has no desire for His bride to go through the tribulation period. So when you encounter someone who believes in a post-trib rapture and they want to doubt your faith, your trust in God because you believe in a pre-trib rapture and they say, oh, you're just looking for a, a way out. I'm looking for that because God said, comfort one another with these words. So yes, I'm comforted with it. I'm glad about it because God said for me to do that. I hope you don't have any question or doubt or worries or fears about you or any loved one you know that's saved having to go through the tribulation period. Would you stand quietly and reverently to your feet with heads bowed and eyes closed? Miss Mary, if you'll come to the piano. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that You'd use this message for Your glory. Lord, I so, so pray that my folks will not worry and spend a moment in fear with thoughts about having to go through the tribulation period. Lord, help them to just trust You, to just believe You at Your Word. Lord, I pray, help us to rightly divide Your Word of truth, to understand Your Word line upon line, precept upon precept, always interpreting Scripture with other Scripture. Lord, help us to make the sense of it. Help my people to be encouraged. And Lord, help us to boldly proclaim the gospel to all those around us. With heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around, Miss Mary, if you'll just begin to play whenever you're ready. Dear friends, I don't know what your need might be this morning. Might be that you have some loved ones that are still not saved and having heard what we heard this morning from the Word of God, if if they're not saved when the trumpet calls, they'll not be taken up with you. They'll be left behind. And they will have to go through that awful period known as the tribulation period. I genuinely believe from what 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says that those that have heard a clear presentation of the gospel, they will be made to believe a lie. Their chance for being saved, I believe, will be over. Friend, can you afford to let your loved one go into the tribulation period because you didn't take the time to share Christ? We've got to throw off all those airs about us and just be honest with people and plead for their souls if need be. Do you and I have the burden for souls we ought to have? Are you ready to meet Jesus today? It could be today before we even get out of here. Are you ready to see Jesus face to face?